Friends, I greet you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And from the activity, the hustle and bustle, spring is in the air. Amen. It's time to start warming up. A few announcements up here this morning. We had 24 in Sunday school. And I, I think that's pretty good for our second week back uh, to all our friends that are at home watching on the YouTube this afternoon. It's time to come on back into church. It's, it's time. I, I have a thank you card, I, and it's from Jan Everett and her family. Dear church family, Words can't even begin to express my gratitude for all that you have done for me since my father passed away. All the cards, calls, prayers, and food were so appreciated. The food that you sent to the Fulton was exactly what my family needed. Thank you again for being such a great support system in Christian love, Jan. And Jan, I'll say... It was an honor to be here to go through that with you. And if you need me, call me. And just keep breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. In and out. Are there any other announcements this morning? All right, we will jump. Yes, ma'am. Joys and concerns. Yes, ma'am. Joy time. It's always joy time, y'all. Zoom is a great tool, and I'm very impressed that you were using it to stay in touch with the kids. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's a great joy. Are there any other joys or concerns this morning? Yes, ma'am. Are there any other joys or concerns? Intern, it's good to have you back with us. I barely recognize you with your mask on. Uh, I will stand here in a moment of silence, and then I'll offer a pastoral prayer, and then we'll all join together in the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of another day that we can join together and worship you. Thank you for birthdays and family visits and friends to celebrate the milestones of life. Hold us together in your grace as we ask for more of these celebrations. Let us continue to see each other through your eyes, eyes of grace and compassion. And thank you for sending Jesus when your time had come to deliver us from our debt to sin and death. And thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to empower your church here on earth. We ask today that you send another breath of that same Spirit as we celebrate this Easter that we would be revived and glean a new meaning from Jesus' resurrection. Help us during this Lenten season to see and to know how you would have us live differently in our lives so we can better serve this world. 
You have heard our joys and our concerns this morning, and we invite you to celebrate with us, and we pray that your will will be done in each of our situations. Comfort us in our loneliness, heal our hurts, but most of all, redeem us from our sinful lives and the destruction that we live so we can be more like Jesus and walk closer to you. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And today we have a special treat. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Would you stand with me for the reading of the gospel? Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said that an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me and for me this morning. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Here is the first verse that I read today. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. Now there's two questions that we ask here. What festival is it talking about? And who were these Greeks? So, to answer those questions, I'm going to ask a question. What festival are we fixing to celebrate here in our Christian church? In the church. <laughs> See, that's the state of Tennessee. Hey, you're still going down the right path. We're fixing to celebrate Easter, right? And Easter is simply an echo of the original Passover when God delivered God's own people out of slavery when they were in Egypt. Do y'all remember that story? Maybe we should have a refresher course so you could get the context. All right, enough of that. Um, so they're coming in, they're all up in, the, in, the, in Jerusalem, and they're celebrating the Passover. Now, some years later, a guy named Josephus wrote a series of historical books. Now, Josephus and Bocephus should not be confused, but I have done it from behind the pulpit, so please forgive me if I do it again today. But in one of Josephus' works, uh, War, he wrote that at a typical Passover in Jerusalem, there were 2.5 million people. Okay? Now, this, this was some years after Jesus had been crucified, uh, resurrected, and ascended. But let's just say, even if you add, say, 5% every year for the 10 or 12 years between Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, and the time Josephus actually wrote it, and then if you just take off half that number, let's just say half, because Josephus was like your preacher, and maybe he liked to embellish a little bit, right? You're still talking over a million people in Jerusalem at Passover. What do you think it would look like if we had a million people just all of a sudden come running into Dresden today? We'd be shoulder to shoulder with everybody, wouldn't we? And you'd never get me out of the parsonage, because that's a traffic jam. I'm not going. So even if he was exaggerating his numbers, it's still a considerable amount of people and they're still jammed in Jerusalem. Now I want to move to the next word, the Greeks. And, and I want to tell a story that uh, my Greek professor in seminary used to tell. 
uh, th there was a guy named Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and he wrote a series of books. Do y'all remember the name? Sherlock Holmes? Well, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson set out, and they go on a cross-country trip. And they're riding their horses. They got a little buggy that they're dragging along behind them. And they come to a, a spot in the field, and Sherlock looks over at, at Dr. Watson, and he says, I think this would be a good place for us to camp tonight. So they unload their stuff. They build a fire. They set up tent. They, they have dinner. and So it's bedtime. They go to bed. And sometime in the night... Sherlock Holmes wakes up and he bumps Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson wakes up. He's like, what, what, what is it? And Sherlock Holmes says, what do you observe about our situation? So Dr. Watson sits up and he starts looking around and he says, well, I can tell that we have a southerly wind blowing in and that means that it's my, there's a chance of rain tomorrow. And Sherlock Holmes says, what else can you deduce about our situation? And he looks around and he looks up and he says, well, I can see the northern star. That means our trip should end fairly early after we get on the road tomorrow. And Sherlock Holmes goes, and what else can you deduce about our situation? And Dr. Watson goes, what are you driving at, Sherlock? What are you driving at? And Sherlock Holmes looks over at him and says, Somebody stole our tent! <laughs> if you can see the sky, feel the wind, somebody stole your tent. So, the reason I tell that story is because today's text doesn't require context. It does not require deep explanation. It does not require great theological theses that I could lay before you and, and dazzle you with some education on what's going on. The word there is Greeks in the Bible. If your Bible says Gentile or foreigners or any other word other than Greek, mark it out and put Greeks. John is not trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Somebody has stolen our tent. That's all there is to it. The Greeks came and they were looking for Jesus. As you look around, you notice my wife is not here today. She is in South Fulton preaching for them. So it's always a battle royale at our house on who's going to get the commentaries first and thumb through them. Well, this past week, Madra won. She got the commentaries first. And so she shows up and she's like, well, this commentary says they were Gentiles. This commentary says this. This commentary says that. This commentary said this over here. My question is, will be and will continue to be what does the Bible say? There's the word in the Bible. It's Greeks. Somebody stole the tent. It's that obvious. That's what John was saying. Some Greeks came to see Jesus. Can I say it any plainer? Do, do we need any? It could have been Jews born in foreign countries. It could have been... Maybe it could have been what it says it is. They were Greeks that came to see Jesus. Now, I will add one layer of context. The Greeks had been taken over by the Romans just like Israel had been taken over by the Romans. So, if we're going to draw any conclusions about the Greeks coming to see Jesus, they were oppressed people as well by the Romans, just like the Israelis were. I can draw no further conclusions except to say, they were Greeks. They were just Greeks. We can't get bogged down and hung up on that any more than I already have. 
So, these Greeks come to a guy named Philip. Now, we know Philip. Philip is one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Yes? He's one of two that had a Greek name. There were Philip and Andrew. Those are Greek names. Because you got Matthew, very Jewish name. You got John, another Jewish name. So you've got all these Jewish guys with Jewish names. Is that really who the Greek people want to go talk to? No, they want to go talk to somebody that, that they might actually understand when they start talking. So the Greek people go to the guy with a Greek name, and that guy with a Greek name goes to another guy with a Greek name, and those two guys go and they see Jesus. Now, it's, it's kind of confusing that Jesus would begin a rant that He does. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, I need to stop right here for just a minute because, again, the commentaries, the educated people, people smarter than me, actually write down that the fact that the Greeks came to see Jesus means that his mission was coming to an end. His reputation, his message was actually going outside of Israel. My argument is God sent Jesus to earth with a timeline. Period. Jesus' timeline does not depend on me. It does not depend on any of you it does not depend on those Greeks that come and meet Philip, and then Philip takes them to Andrew, and then Philip and Andrew go see Jesus. No. Jesus' timeline depended solely on God. And as we are cranking up to Passover, this would have been Jesus' third Passover in His ministry, according to the Gospel of John. So, Jesus goes immediately into a parable. And I would argue that this one parable is different than any of the other parables that we hear. Usually we hear that the kingdom of God can be compared to whatever. This time, Jesus tells a direct parable that reflects His life and His mission here on earth. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, Jesus died. Jesus took our death. We can say all of that. Jesus rose from the dead, and then Jesus ascended into heaven. Right? There's the rock hitting the pond. The original disciples, including the twelve apostles, they were the first generation of Christians. And it rippled out from there. They had a harvest, and then that next group, they had a harvest, and that next group had a harvest, and that next group had a harvest, and that next group had a harvest down through the years for 2,000 years now. And guess what? You and I are a result of a harvest that happened the generation before us. And they were a result of a harvest that happened before them. We can trace it all the way back to Jesus' death and resurrection and this parable right here explains the whole thing. Unless a preacher dies. So Jesus tells this parable to explain His life, His death, and His resurrection. Because without Jesus, and without Jesus' death, there will not be much fruit. Because without Jesus' death, you don't have what? The resurrection. And remember what I've said about C.S. Lewis. 
C.S. Lewis wrote, Jesus was either mad, bad, or he was God. And with the resurrection, we have the proof that Jesus is who he says he is, and that is God. And we don't serve a God of the dead. We serve the God of the living. I'm sure I read that somewhere. Now, Jesus goes into a story here, or, or tells, tells it like it is, basically. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Have I talked about a guy named Joe Donjel to y'all ever? Uh, Joe Donjel was my New Testament professor at, at Asbury Seminary. Brilliant man. Um, about the first three class periods, I was sitting there wondering if I shouldn't drop his class because when he talked, he talked way up here, kind of over my head, and I, I really didn't quite comprehend everything. But he said of these, these words right here that Jesus was speaking in hyper hyperbole. Did you, get, did you catch that? Hyper hyperbole. If you love your life, you will lose it. In other words, if you love things in this life so much, you will lose your life into those things that you love. But if you hate this life, and I would argue that Jesus does not want you to hate this life. Again, this is hyper hyperbole. You get that? Hyper hyperbole. Because most people that hate this life end up like Judas hanging from a tree. And you will never convince me that Jesus wants you to hang yourself from a tree. Are we clear on that? But if you love God more than you love the things in this world, then everything in this world will work itself out and you will have your priorities right. I love my wife, but I love God more than I love my wife. For years, y'all know my story, I rode a Harley Davidson around all over the place. In fact, as I came out of my house, the truck sat in the driveway, the Harley sat in the carport. If I was going to take the truck, I had to walk past the Harley. Guess what I ended up riding the majority of the time? When I walked to the truck, the Harley's right here. The problem with the Harley was just about every weekend I would get that Harley out, I would hose it down with the hose and I would scrub it and I would wash it and then I would get down on one knee kind of like when y'all see me get down on one knee up here at this altar and I would polish that bike and I would polish it. Do you see what I'm saying? And I kept that bike between me and God every hour of every day. And finally God took it away from me. Because God knew I loved that bike more than I loved Him. I've been kind of hard-headed all my life. So all it took was one little accident to get me in line, right? But if we love things in this world too much, we will lose our lives in those things. But if we keep our priorities straight, God, family, church, and then everything else, everything else will work itself out. Amen?